No, you can't? That's better. I had a feeling it wasn't quite there. Anyway, anyway welcome to um, any of our uh, guests this morning who are visiting uh, for the first time or, or if you're back for other reasons. We, we certainly uh, want to say hello and welcome you. Um, we do have a time of fellowship afterwards as usual, t- tea and coffee and Vicky's after the service. Um, special hello to uh, our live streaming people uh, and also to our church family at Blaney who I believe are live streaming today. So hopefully you can hear this and see us. So welcome. Um, Angus, I'll hand over to you. All right, I've got uh, just two announcements for us today, but firstly, hello. Uh, welcome to church. It's good uh, to be here. I say two, I've actually got three. The first one is today, don't forget... Uh, The Easter Family Festival is happening today, Uh, so that's down at Robertson Park, Uh, so you feel free to head down there straight after church. Uh, Looks like it'll be a wonderful afternoon uh, celebrating uh, Easter. Uh, And speaking of Easter, next week uh, we are having our regular Good Friday and Easter Sunday services, so Good Friday is at 9 o'clock here, and then our regular services on Sunday uh, for Resurrection Sunday. Uh, as we spend time uh, really zeroing... Uh... <laughs> zeroing back in on the cross. I'm going to turn that off. 24 and 25. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Blaney. It's good to see you. Easter's next week. (laughs) Lost my train of thought. Uh, The other thing was uh, just a reminder uh, about our sitting on the veranda uh, half-day conference that we're hosting, uh, that we're putting on here as a church family. Uh, So this is a great opportunity for anyone in our church family, no matter what ministries you are serving in or thinking about serving in. uh, This is a time where uh, we can spend half a day together uh, thinking about uh, the call for us to be uh, sharing the good news of Jesus Uh, with those in our community and options and opportunities for us to do that. Uh, We've got a number of people within our church community sharing uh, about all sorts of aspects about what it means uh, to be uh, stepping out in faith and uh, loving and blessing our community with the good news of Jesus. Uh, We're actually closing registrations tomorrow. Uh, The reason is so we can sort out things like catering and childcare, that kind of thing. Uh, It is a free event. I sent out an email during the week about that. Uh, please come along. It looks like it'll be a really wonderful morning uh, together as a church family, being equipped uh, with some really specific things uh, as we think about uh, sharing the good news of Jesus. Uh, so that's happening on April uh, the 6th. There's a QR code. You can scan. That'll take you through a Google form. Uh, if you're having a bit of trouble there, you can actually just also email Kate Baxter. Uh, her email address uh, is here in the uh, bulletin, also in the emu. Uh, so that's all the announcements. Thanks, Ben. Um, And I should have said sorry for those who are new. My name's Ben. Uh, I'm one of the elders uh, here at St. James. Um, I'm sure many of you know that today is Palm Sunday. Um, That is the Sunday before Easter. And I'm going to read in a second a little bit from Psalm 118 about um, how our total dependence from being saved from our sin, our rebellion, um, way back from Genesis 3, Uh, comes from God and it comes from God alone. So I'm just going to read verses 8 to 17 and and we'll just see how the victory that was won uh, for us is the Lord's doing. And the psalmist writes from verse 8, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord I cut them down. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. They swarmed around me like bees, but they were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them down. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my defence. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. Um, So we'll come together now in a time of 
uh, praise uh, and confession. So if you'd like to join with me as I lead us in prayer this morning. Thank you. <clears throat> Father God, we give thanks uh, that we can gather here freely this morning to worship and to praise you. Father, we thank you that Jesus is seated at your right hand and he is interceding for us now. We thank you that you've made it possible for us to live with you eternally through uh, Jesus so that sin and death have been defeated. We thank you that we are seen holy in your eyes and that our lives uh, are now hidden with Christ. Father, may we remember the triumphal entry into Jerusalem that Jesus made on a humble donkey. The excitement of the crowds watching and the songs of praise would have been wonderful to witness as the almighty King and Saviour was acclaimed and worshipped. Yet despite the, great, the sense of great things to happen back then, it would be a mere week before the crowds would be influenced by the Jewish leaders and turn on Jesus, calling for him to be killed. Even his loyal disciples who were with him in the garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane, Gethsemane yes, rejected knowing him. Lord, you know, that's very easy for us to become tempted by the false promises of this world. Help us to be reminded that such promises will not fully satisfy and will not provide us with eternal salvation. Father, we're sorry for when we do sin. We give thanks that we have been forgiven through Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross at Calvary. Um, may, we be, be, may we be reminded to focus our hearts on you and live lives that are pleasing to you according to your word. Father, we thank you that you, you do not change and that your word stands true forever. We're thankful that we can come to you at any time, Lord. We ask that you help uh, provide us confidence to be able to share your good news with others who are struggling or for those who are lost. We know that we can't do this without you and we ask that you'll give us the right words to say when these situations arise. And Father, we pray for our service this morning. We pray that we will come to you with hearts that are focused on Christ. Please allow our minds to not be distracted but to come in spirit so that our eyes and ears will be attentive to giving you all honour and praise as we meet here as your family of brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Apologies for getting that garden name tongue twister. Um, please stand and join for our first uh, song this morning. We've got a wonderful crew here this morning. The JPY band are playing. Um, so please stand and join for our first uh, him this morning, our first song is Rejoice, which is... So yes, we've got the JPY band up here, so it's like a great time. So this song may be new to some of you. If you do know it, make sure you sing loud because it's going to be good.
Thanks, guys. I'll ask uh, Len, Len Elliott's going to um, bring us our Bible readings this morning. Uh, if you have a Bible handy, that would be great. The words will be on the screen. Um, the first is from Romans 5, and Len will be then reading from Genesis chapter 3. Thanks, Len. Romans 5, verses 12 to 17 is the first reading. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, Death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as Adam did. It was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. For judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. And the second reading again is Genesis 3, verses 14 to 24. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve, because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. the kids up the front. Uh, if you'd like to come up over here on the side, uh, Lachlan's bringing us the kids this morning. Right here. <laughs> Hello everyone. How are you all? 
Is anyone excited for Easter? Yeah? What happens at Easter? What do you guys do at Easter? Yeah, chocolate eggs? Yeah, nice. Do you get normal eggs? Does any of you paint normal eggs? Sometimes. I've never done it, but I know some people do. It's kind of cool. All right, so did any of you hear the Bible reading that was just read out? Did any of you hear that? Or can any of you tell me what have we been doing here in church and what part of the Bible have we been reading at church? Can anyone tell me? What part of the Bible? Genesis. What? Where's Genesis? Where's Genesis? At the start, or the start of everything, right? So that's what we've been looking at, isn't it? Been looking at the start of everything. Now I want to ask you guys: Have you ever done something bad? Have you ever done something bad? Yeah, yeah. I've done something bad once, or twice, maybe a bit more than that. Has anyone think about this a bit harder? Has anyone done something nice to you after you did something bad? Has anyone done something nice to you after you did something bad? Whoa, that's a harder question, isn't it? Harder question to think about. Has anyone done something nice to you after you did something bad? Who can tell me who were the first ever people to do something bad? Adam and Eve, that's right. Adam and Eve were the first person, they were the first people ever, right? And one day they decided, I actually want to rule my life. I want to be king. I don't want God telling me what to do. What do we call that when we say, I want to rule my life and I don't want God telling me what to do? What do we call that? What's a word we call that? Yeah? Sin, that's right. So Adam and Eve, all the way back in the beginning, they sinned. Now, what happened to them? Can anyone tell me what happened to Adam and Eve? Did they drop dead on the spot? No. What happened to them? Say again. Anyone else want to help him out? What happened to Adam and Eve? Can anyone tell me? Yeah? Trouble. They got in trouble, didn't they? They did get in trouble. Heaps of trouble. God came and he got them in trouble. And so he did, he, there were, who was involved? So it was Adam and Eve, but who else was there? Yeah, there was a, there was a snake. Yeah, the evil one. So God came, he got them all in trouble. God said to the snake, you're going to crawl on the ground for the rest of your life. God said to Eve, it's going to hurt a lot when you have babies. And God said to Adam, it's going to be so hard just to make a living. The ground's going to be so tough. You're going to be struggling a lot just to get by. So they got in trouble, didn't they? But I wonder if you notice, I don't, I wonder if you notice, at the end of the reading that we just had, there was another verse where God, God is sending them out of the Garden of Eden. They have to go out into the world, out into the dangerous world. It's a bit scary. They're getting, they're in trouble, aren't they? But God does something. God gives them some clothes. God gives them a bit of protection from the outside of the world. Because the Garden of Eden was nice and safe, wasn't it? But outside wasn't safe. But God gave them some clothes. Now, do you think that maybe, just maybe, God still loves them? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know, God still loves them. Do you know, when we do something bad, which we do, we do do bad things, don't we? Do you know, even when we do something bad, God still loves us. He loves us. And we, instead of running away from God, we can turn back to God and say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And you know what he does? He does forgive us through Jesus. Isn't that pretty cool? He still loves us and he forgives us. I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing a song together. Dear God, thank you so much that you still love us even when we sin, even when we do things bad. And I pray that uh, when we do that, that we would turn to you instead of running away, that we would ask for forgiveness, and we thank you that Jesus has saved us and has forgiven us for all the wrong things that we've done. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's stand up. Want to sing a song?
I'm going to run across the stage. JPY? No JPY. Sunday school. Head on out, please. <laughs> um, I'll invite Jeff Langdon up to pray for others. Jeff's going to lead us in prayer now. So, Thanks, Jeff. going to spend some time in prayer. A couple of things that God's Word tells us ought to be an encouragement to us as we come before God. In Isaiah 62, through the prophet, God says, Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. In Jeremiah, he says, Call to me and I will answer you until you greaten th and hidden things that you do not know. Let us then bow for a time of prayer. Let's pray. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Father, we recognise that indeed you are a holy God. So great is your holiness that you cannot abide sin. <clears throat> and in the words of the prophet, we, we recognise that we are, without Christ, we are lost. But Lord, we thank you that as we uh, approach the, this time of the year, as we, rec as we uh, recognise the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf, we thank you that we can be made holy in your sight. We thank you, our God, that you did not spare your only Son. In spite of the sinfulness of humanity, 
in spite of all the wrong things that people have done and continue to do. Uh, Lord, we, uh, we stand amazed at the wonderful grace that you have shown towards us. Today, as we come together, our God, we, we pray for our nation. We pray for its leaders. We ask our God that in every, every level of government that the people would govern with honesty and integrity, that they would learn to lean upon you and to seek your will and to know your desire for our nation. Lord, we pray too for the areas in the, on this planet that are still troubled by conflict. We think of the Middle East. We think again of the conflict in Ukraine. And our hearts are saddened, even breaking, as we see the loss of life and the destruction and the hatred. Oh, Father, we pray that in some miraculous way people might learn to lean upon you, to look to you and to understand that there is, there is a God, a God who does care. And even in the midst of, of uncertainty and the things that are going on around us, help us to remember and to take to heart the fact that God is still on the throne and everything is still in his hand. Lord, we pray for those of our fellowship who are struggling with the issues of life, it may be physical, it may be financial, uh, it may be other ways. We know, Lord, that there are some who are grieving. And Father, we pray that again that they would lean upon you, put their trust in you, and that they would experience the peace of God that passes all understanding. And Father, as we uh, draw close to the, to the Easter season, again we recognise what it cost you to, to secure our salvation. It cost you your only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we know that there are many millions of people who have no time, have no time for the things of God, have no time for the, to hear the message that Jesus loves them. He gave himself for them. And Father, we pray that wherever your, your word is proclaimed, wherever, even today, as your word goes out across this city and across this nation, our prayer is, our God, that it would go, for, go out with with force and with power and conviction that it would draw people to, to you. Because it is only in you that there is hope for this world. And Father, we, we pray for our, our church here. We pray for its leaders. And uh, Lord, we just pray that, that you would strengthen them and, and sustain them, uphold them, keep them well physically, continue to strengthen them spiritually. And Father, as we uh, bring this time to a close, our thoughts turn to, um, to those who have, have left uh, this, uh, this land and have gone to other places uh, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for them. May they be sustained by the power of your Holy Spirit. May they continue to be uplifted by the work that your, your Spirit is doing in the lives to those who minister, to whom they minister. And Father, we, we pray that in due course that they, there may be a harvest of souls for the cause of the kingdom of God. And so, Lord, we pray that as we continue in this time together this morning, we pray that, uh, that as Angus comes and ministers to us from your word, may your Holy Spirit speak to us. May your Holy Spirit enlighten us and encourage us. We ask all of these things in the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, please join together now as we sing our next uh, hymn. Uh, it's called Hymn of the Saviour. Please stand.
From the chaos of the world shaped for us, we pray each other. But we trade it for the truth for the light, and the glory for the future. God has made a blessing you gave. To the people of your name, for His broken world, a Savior foretold to bear our grief and shame. to Genesis chapter 3 uh, as we uh, look at this part of your word together. Uh, that song that we've just sung uh, really paints for us a beautiful picture of what it is that we're on about as we trace God's wonderful story of salvation uh, through the scriptures. Uh, and so as we come now uh, to really finish our time in Genesis finish our time in Genesis 3. Uh, as always, let's pray that God would help us. Father, uh, we do thank you for the promise that you made to send a saviour. That despite our sin, despite our rejection of your rule, you in love chose to save. And as we continue tracing that story of redemption here in Genesis 3, Father, it's our prayer that you would open our hearts to receive your word. 
that again you would amaze us with your great glory revealed in Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So in the year 2000, after uh, the second of the three founding members of the band, the Whitlams, uh, died, the last remaining uh, member of the original lineup, Tim Friedman, uh, wrote this song uh, called The Curse Stops Here. Here is the first verse in the chorus. Stevie left on Friday too. They made the easy way look hard. We never thought too much about letting go. They took it all too far again. My first days back and I was rolling around town saying, stay away from edges, from ropes if you can, because I'm the last one and the curse stops here. The curse stops here. It's a haunting yet hopeful song of determination. That the curse that seemed to plague this band, this man's best friends, he's saying, will not take him. That the curse stops with him. And you know, sometimes we can feel the weight of the fall. That, that things are just too hard, that there is too much brokenness in the world, that my sin is just far too great for Jesus to really forgive me yet again, or that how could Jesus have actually paid for my sin in the first place when my sin is so great? Can there really be an end to the curse? Where does the curse of the fall end? Well, friends, we need to remember that salvation doesn't rely on or isn't affected at how bad things really are. It all rests on Jesus. The curse stops with him. You know, if you trace the story of Genesis 1 to 3 uh, that we've been following in these last, uh, really this term, we've seen how God has been at work. Remember all the way back to chapter 1, verse 1, we've seen God as the almighty, holy creator who made everything through speaking a word. And everything that he made was fit for purpose. And we saw, remember, he crowned his creation with the creation of humanity as his image bearers that were given a place of honour to represent, to reflect and to rule God's good world. We've seen, remember, how God rested from his creative work, setting up this pattern of work and rest, but also foreshadowed the ultimate and eternal rest in his kingdom. We've traced the story of God's image bearers, who God formed with the purpose of serving God in his temple, that the garden itself was the temple where where God dwelt with his people. And how God provided Adam with a suitable helper in the creation of Eve. And everything was perfect. And then, as we saw last week, everything came crashing down. Like like Pandora's box being opened and releasing curses into the world, sin entered. Humanity disobeyed God's commands and they were filled with shame, hiding from God. Discord and mistrust had already begun to spread between Adam and Eve and now we bring it all together. How will this end? Will the curse really stop? Is there any good to come out of this tragic story? What can we learn for us for ourselves as we think about the reality of sin, the reality of this fallen world in which we live? Will there be an end to the curse? 
Well, as we walk through these final verses of Genesis chapter 3, we're going to see firstly thinking about the curse uh, in verses 14 to 15, about the consequences in verses 16 to 19, and finally the gift of grace in verses 20 to 24. So let's jump in, look at we look with me at verses 14 and 15, 15. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. If you remember last week when, when they were in the garden and, Adam, and, and God was asking Adam uh, firstly, you know, what have you done? Where are you? And then he asked Eve the same questions. What have you done? Well, here God does not even give the serpent a chance to speak, does he? And as God speaks, what does he do? He pronounces a curse on the serpent. Because the serpent has deceived. The serpent has brought sin into the world and he will now suffer the curse of God. That above all other animals, the serpent is to be cursed. Now, that's not just saying, you know, that, that's not saying that, you know, as, as he says, you will crawl now on your, on your belly all the days of your life. That's not saying that somehow snakes had arms and legs beforehand and now they do not. No, it's saying that, that the serpent itself is now cursed. This animal, this, this reptile will be the one that fills us with fear. That it is the, he's saying it is the lowest of lows that on the ground it will go eating dust. But within this curse, we see something. We see something significant about what God says to the snake in the relationship between the offspring of the serpent and the offspring of the woman. For what is set up here is a lifelong conflict between these two seeds, these two offsprings. And who is that? Well, if we think about the seed of the serpent, or to use a different word or a different way of describing it, the sons of man will be at conflict with the seed of the woman or the sons of God, those who trust God and those who do not. And you see, right now we see there is this conflict at play. And that though the snake will bruise or strike at the foot of the offspring of the woman, her offspring will crush its head. Saying that that this, this, this conflict will be ongoing, but ultimately the victory will belong to the offspring of the woman. But also notice what God is doing here. Remember, Eve had been, she'd been brought in to the lies of the snake. She was seduced by his lies. She believed him rather than God, and the work of the snake had done this. And this had brought death. And and Eve, in a sense, was under his rule. Yet what does God do? He says, I'm going to put enmity between you. God is driving a wedge between them in the pronouncement of this curse. God is is taking her out from his web of lies and and saying to her, I'm giving you a promise. I'm giving you a promise through the curse that is being pronounced on this snake. Because through her offspring, the serpent will be crushed. And, and, And notice that the curse is actually not on God's image bearers themselves. Yes, they have fallen into sin. Yes, sin is described as a curse, but God does not curse those whom he has made to represent and rule this world. No, he curses the one 
who brought sin into the world. But his image bearers will still have to suffer the consequences of their sin. They will still have to endure the consequences of what they have done. Which is what we see in the next few verses, in verses 16 to 19, because we know that every action has a consequence. Sin itself has consequences. And we see this so strongly here in the way in which God speaks to his image bearers about what's going to happen as a result of what they have done. And what are these consequences? Well, at its heart, it's, it's the, consequ- the consequences are all to do with their roles as image bearers. Remember back in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1, verse 28, God said this, look with me. God blessed them, and he said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves along the ground. Then God said, I I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. You see, God has given a task to humanity. To be fruitful, to to multiply, to, to fill the earth, to subdue it, to have dominion over it, to work and cultivate the ground. And where had God placed them? He'd placed them to begin with in God's good garden. And remember, the garden was the place that God himself had planted, filled with trees that were good for food. And so now, as sin has come crashing into the world, the, one of the, the consequences of sin are, the very, are affecting the very task that humanity was given by God. Everything now becomes harder to do the things that God had called them to do. Look what he says to Eve in verse 16. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labour you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. You see, multiplying and filling the earth through the bearing of children, the consequence of the fall means this becomes harder. The perfect relationship between husbands and wives is now ruptured and disharmony has come. Where there was once harmony, there is now discord and sin has meant the relationships become places of struggle and control rather than harmony, all because of sin. Filling and multiplying, filling and subduing the earth becomes harder as a result of sin. But it also continues out in the exercising of dominion. Look at verses 17 to 19. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and dust you will return. You see, for humanity to, to, to exercise dominion of this earth, well, that will now be brought about through toil, through pain, through sweat, rather than, than working a garden that God had planted He is to work the ground that he now must plant. And it will be tough. 
It will sprout thorns. Work, which was once a joy, becomes a task. And ultimately, we see in verse 19 that the consequence of the fall is what God himself promised would happen if they ate of the fruit, and what is that? Death. They will return to the dust. Sin has meant they will die. That all the labours of humanity to work and feel and subdue is is now something that death will bring an end to. You see, the consequences of the fall for God's image bearers are so far-reaching. But remember, they are still his image bearers. Humanity are still made in God's image. God is still saying that children will be born. He is still saying that they will work the ground, but now the fall has made this harder. Because God's word was not followed and trusted. But we see that God does not give up on his people. God never gives up on his people. He does not turn away from those who have trusted him. God does not start over. Instead, he gives amazing gifts of grace to his people. And as he's doing so, he, he's telling them that, that this curse that, that has come about through the fall, this curse will not define you as his people. God's grace will. Look with me, verses 20 to 24. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. The Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he'd been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. You see, these these last few verses here are verses that show God's grace. Verse 20, we see Adam doing something that shows that he is trusting God. Trusting in God's promises in the way he names his wife Eve. He names her Eve for she, it says, is the mother of all living. See, right there, Adam is saying he he knows that life will come through her that children would come through her, that their offspring would come. You see, in naming Eve, Adam is saying, I trust you, God, to be faithful to your promise that you will send an offspring who will crush this serpent's head. It is an act of faith right there. Trusting in God's promise that the curse will stop. And what does God do next? Again, he shows his grace to Adam and Eve by clothing them. Remember, their nakedness was their shame. The fall had exposed them utterly and completely, and they'd, remember, they'd tried and they'd failed to hide their shame through making coverings out of fig leaves. And so God in his grace clothes them. He provides them with skins to to fully clothe them. Don't don't have a picture in your mind of like a Tarzan and Jane kind of outfit. No, these are are cloaks. These are tunics that, that cover the entire body. They are clothed and protected. They are clothed in an act of grace. God covers 
over their shame. And in doing so, he's also preparing them for life outside the garden, for these clothes will keep them warm. These clothes will protect them from the elements. And they are skins provided from animals. Something had to die in order for them to be clothed. And with this, God must send them out of the garden. Why? He says, because they've sought to become like God in knowing good and evil. They've sought moral autonomy outside of God. And if they stay, if they were to stay in the garden and eat from the tree of life, they would be forever doomed. So God sends his image bearers out from his garden, out from his presence. And whilst it is certainly a consequence of their disobedience, it is also an incredible act of grace. For God is protecting his people from being dead in sin forever. So he sends them out, he drives them out, he casts them out of his presence. And as they go, we see just how far humanity has fallen. Fallen from that wonderful place of perfect relationship with God. Where where they were in the very presence of God, in the garden serving Him. A beautiful marriage serving together and now being driven from the garden. They are stepping out into the world away from his presence. You know, you can almost imagine that as they left that that place, as they're walking away from the garden and turning back and, and looking and seeing these cherubim that God has placed at the entrance of the garden, guarding the way back into God's presence. They were there to remind them that because of your sin, you cannot come in. And now they would walk away from God, away from his presence, outside the garden. They would never know life in Eden again. Their children would be born outside the garden, and yet they had a promise. They had a promise that an offspring would come who would crush the head of this serpent that the curse of sin would come to an end. For right here at the beginning, in the tragedy of the fall, we see a glimmer of hope because the offspring will come. The grand story unfolds throughout Scriptures. And as we we read through the pages of Scripture, we we see where is this offspring? Where, Where is the seed of the woman who is going to finally crush the head of this snake? Who is the one who is going to end the curse of the fall? We we see glimpses, we see pictures of hope, but it is never fully realized. Cain, Abel, Seth, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, the judges, Saul, David, the kings, and yet none of them are the seed. Through the history of God's people, as families, as slaves, as wanderers, as as doubters, as exiles, as subjects of empires. God's promise remained that one day the serpent's head would be crushed by the seed of the woman. And we know that finally he did come. For God would never break that promise. Remember, God does not break his promises. And as Jesus hung on a Roman cross, naked, exposed, he took on the curse of sin. He bore the judgment that we deserve because of our sin. He suffered so that we would not be doomed forever. He suffered to save you. He suffered to save you from your sin. He suffered to save me from mine. 
And he died so that you and I could be clothed in his righteousness. And he rose to life. He rose to life on that third day, announcing that his victory has been won over the serpent. That as he walked out of the grave on that first Easter Sunday, he crushed the head of the serpent, breaking the curse of sin. And in that victory, he promised a final day where that serpent will be cast into hell for eternity to suffer for the evil and sin that he brought into the world. And it's all been won by our Saviour Jesus. Which means that though we walk through the wilderness now, outside of the garden, where we experience the tragic effects of the fall in in many shades, from from the sin that torments, from the fallen condition that, that frustrates our efforts, or to the sickness, to the struggles, God remains, for He is faithful. For no matter how bad, how dark, how difficult, how frustrating life gets because of this fallen world, Remember, our Saviour has paid for your sin. Not just, not just ours, He's paid for the sins of the world, He's taken it on Himself so this curse would be broken. He has forgiven you. And no matter how much the discord, the disharmony may, may be there, God remains. No matter how difficult it may be, he calls his people to keep going to remember that he has come in Christ. So even when the toiling seems unending, that when there, when there doesn't seem to be any fruit being produced, or that when, whenever you put your hands to do something, it just feels like you're working on hard, barren ground. Remember, God has remained faithful to his promise to shatter the curse of sin. That, that when the thorns and, and the thistles seem to affect everything that you do, that they try and choke out and take your eyes off the good blessings that God has given you, remember our Lord our Saviour who has died and risen again to give you life. That though you may feel at times like your sin has condemned you to a life of shame, remember God in Christ, through his death and his resurrection for you, has clothed you in his righteousness. That you stand forgiven at the cross. Brothers and sisters, we, we, we cannot ignore just how much sin has plagued us. We, we, can, we cannot comprehend just how great this moment of rebellion in Genesis 3 cast us off into the wilderness, and yet the wonder, the hope, the power of the gospel that was promised there in Genesis 3.15 that has been fulfilled in Christ is that Christ has dealt with your sin, paid with it, and brought you back into his presence. So you don't need to listen to the lies of the snake. Saying, did God really say? Does it really matter that you say no to God's word? No, we don't listen to those lies. We listen to the words of our Saviour. For our story doesn't end with being left in the wilderness. With being left in our sin. No, if you put your faith in Jesus, rested in what he has done for you alone to save your life is in him. 
He is our all in all, for the curse of the fall met its end in Jesus. Remember in Galatians 3 verse 13, when when Paul writes to the church, he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Christ came to pay for your sin so that you could have eternal life. And that through Jesus, the curse of the fall is undone. And that is the grand story that you and I are are called up into. And so, as as we leave Genesis, let let us keep our eyes fixed on our Saviour, who one day promised, has promised a day where He will return where he will return and make all things new again. And we will dwell with him in a new heavens and a new earth where peace reigns. And it has all been won by him. Hear the words of this hope, this this vision of hope that we have that has been won in Jesus in Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost, from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this and I will be their God and they will be my children. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that the curse of the fall met its end in Jesus. That he died to pay for sin. Father, we thank you for that amazing promise that Jesus is making all things new. That that there is a hope that is forever because of him. And though we walk now in the wilderness, awaiting that final day, may we know that we stand forgiven as God's children, resting wholly, clothed fully in our Saviour Jesus and what he's done for us at the cross. Help us stand in this grace always. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing our final song as we close our time together, uh, the song Grace. Thanks, team.
let's sing together. Join together now in our benediction. Um, that was just a wonderful finish to that song, I must admit. It was great. Um, so we'll come together now in prayer. Father, may we remember this day, this Palm Sunday, celebrating the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey as our Saviour and King. What an awesome sight it would have been, uh, giving Jesus this royal treatment, hearing the people shout, Hosanna to the Son of David, 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Father, we thank you for the scripture of Jesus' triumphal entry as the true King of Kings. Amen. Have a great rest of your Sunday.